So we're going to start uh, with terminology. Oh, uh, terminology is actually a good thing because um, it, it really says something like, hey, there's, there's this interesting group of differential equations that we can put together and there's something that we can say about them that's nice. Usually we don't make terminology for things that aren't nice. So what can we say? Well, so we say that a first order differential equation is linear. And uh, I'm going to highlight that word linear as though to indicate it's an important word. If it can be written in the form y prime plus p of x times y equals q of x. And p of x, q of x, arbitrary functions of x. They can be very, very exotic, but uh, they only depend on x. Now, why do we care about things being linear? You hear that word a lot. You may have heard it in calculus when you say, oh, uh, derivatives are linear, or integrals are linear. Uh, there's this wonderful topic called uh, linear algebra, and there's a whole course on it, and how, about how wonderful it is and what we can do with it. And so linear things, what makes them wonderful? Well, they're, basically the idea of linear things is that they're nice and simple and flat. So in particular, one of the things that I think about when I hear the word linear is I really say it, it says you can combine by doing two things. Namely, you can scalar multiply, which basically means you multiply by a number or a constant. And the other thing you can do is you can add. And that's the, what you can do. So the idea of, of linear says, hey, these two operations are available and they work. And you might say, well, wait, how does that fit in? Well, it says, look at the way you combine with respect to y. And when you look at it with respect to y, there's really two pieces. There's a y prime and a y. And what do we have? Well, there's multiples in front, like the p of x. But in, in, in terms of y, that's basically like a number. You know, this is x is, is something else. And then we can add these two things together. All right, so there we go. That's the idea. So whenever you hear linear, that's in the back of your head. I can combine things through scalar multiplication and addition. All right, good. Well, let's, uh, let's test ourselves, see if we understand. So suppose we ask the question, e to the x, y prime, is equal to uh, x squared y plus uh, arctangent of cosine of x. All right, is this linear? Yes. Okay, so, some people are saying yes, some people are being very hesitant, and uh, you might say, wait, it doesn't look like this, Steve. Well, notice there's a key word, can. It can be written in that form. And so what can you do? Well, you can, for example, move the x squared y to their side. What else can you do? Yeah, divide by this e to the x. And then it's of the right form. So that is something which is linear. Of course, uh, do we care about the fact that, you know, you have things like x squared or arctangent cosine x? No, no, it's the, we're looking at the y parts. If the y parts are behaving in a nice way, we say it's, it's linear. Okay, how about uh, uh, y prime plus y y prime uh, is equal to uh, sine of x. All right, what about that? Is that linear? No, not linear, not linear. Okay, the problem is that the yy prime, that breaks it, that breaks it. Could we solve that problem? y prime plus yy prime equals sine of x? And how could we do it? So the two questions, can we solve it yeah. and how? So yes, we can solve it. How? It's yeah, it's still separable. So separable and this linear are different concepts. So something can be separable, but not be linear. 
something can be linear, but not be separable. So be careful. You now that's why we have to have all these fun bits and pieces here. Now why do we care about these? And the, it's this fact at the bottom. We care about things when we can solve. And beautiful fact. It says, look, suppose you have one of these things. A first order linear equation, y prime plus p of x times y equals q of x, and there's an initial condition. Now we want to solve. And the answer is, we always can solve. As long as p of x and q of x are nice, no problem. We can solve it. So that says, wow, great, fantastic. This is something that we can solve. We can solve. We have the technology. Now, why is the fact true? Well, basically, the fact is true because we're going to do it. We're going to actually give us a, ourselves a technique that allows us to say, and here's the answer. So that's about the first 20 minutes is we're going to go through and explain how do you solve these problems. And then the last part of the, the class today, practice, practice. So where do we begin? Well, we start with a question. What's easy to integrate? What do you think? Yeah, derivative. Now you might say, wow, how did you figure that out? Well, they said it right here. You know, that's in math class. You look for the answer on the board. It's either zero, one, or it's on the board. And uh, you might say, what's well, easy to integrate? Zero. Yeah, okay, keep going. So, um, that, the answer to that question is like, you say, okay, that's totally obvious. I know how to integrate derivatives because if I take a derivative of something, I can sort of go backwards. And so it seems like such an obvious statement. But everything we talk about today is built off of this idea. Namely, we say, okay, well, let's think about making things look like derivatives. And then we can have an easier time. And in particular, if we're thinking about this, this expression, y prime plus p of x, y equals q of x, we say, look, the hard part is the stuff that involves y. So our goal is to say, we want that stuff that involves y we want that stuff to look like a derivative, and then we can, we can do it. We can integrate that part. Then we have other stuff, but that other stuff will just only involve x. So there we go. All right, so let's work ourselves our way through this first example. And this will really help us sort of get the spirit of what's going on, the philosophy, if you will. Okay, so there's three parts here. Start with part A. What's the derivative? of x squared y, or y equals y of x. What rule do you need when you take the derivative of x squared y? Product rule. All right, so how does product rule work? Well, you can say, look, leave the first alone, take the derivative of the second. So, x squared, what's the derivative of y? Yeah, derivative of y is y prime, also known as the derivative of y. Okay, great. Are we done? What else do we need? All right. Derivative of the first term, derivative of x squared, 2x. Anything else? Well, I'm asking if there's anything else because that's, oh, 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 oh. You meant the very, I'm so sorry. This is what happens when you're rusty for a few days. Okay. All right. x squared y prime, 2xy. Great. We're pretty convinced about that. Any questions? We good? Okay. So, all right, we're ready for part B. So, it says, look, find this function y, given x squared y prime plus 2xy is 5 halves x to the 3 halves, and there's this initial condition, y of 1 equals 2. And now we look at that and say, oh, Steve hasn't told us anything about how to solve these problems. How do we start? Well, does any part of this look familiar? Yeah, this left-hand side looks really familiar, almost like we've seen it somewhere before. Yeah. So we say, wait a second here. We, we can 
we can make progress. Because we say, look, that left-hand side looks like part A. And part A was a derivative. So we have that the derivative of x squared y is equal to 5 halves x to the 3 halves. Great. Well, what's easy to integrate? Derivative. So that would say, I can integrate that left-hand side pretty easy. So I'm going to integrate the left-hand side. I'll throw a little dx here. Integrate the right-hand side. So what is the integral of the derivative of x squared y? Yeah, x squared y. OK, equals, what's the integral of 5 halves x to the 3 halves? OK, what about the constant in front? Wow, almost as though it had been planned that way. Because it was planned that way. And then someone said plus c. All right, good. Uh, are we done? OK, well, we want to find y. OK, so we can divide by x squared, get y by itself x to the 5 halves divided by x squared. What is that? So 5 halves, if you divide by x squared, it's like we, we subtract the exponents. 5 halves subtract 2, what does that give us? 1 half. So we can write that as square root of x. If we take the constant c, divide by x squared, what will that give us? A c divided by x squared. All right. So everything has to be divided by x squared. You get divided by x squared. You get divided by x squared. Every single term gets divided by x squared. So, so be careful here. Do the algebra correctly. You're more likely to get points if you get the right answer. Actually, it's true. It's true that you are. Are we done? What's left? Yeah, yeah, initial conditions. All right, all right. So that says when x equals 1, y equals 2. So we get that 2 is equal to the square root of 1, 1, plus c over 1 squared, c. So what is c? c is 1. OK. So y equals the square root of x plus 1 over x squared. Life is good. All right. That wasn't so bad. Because we said, hey, great news. We had a derivative on the left-hand side. That let us integrate. Woohoo! That was part B. Now, part C. Says, hey, let's do a different problem. Find y given xy prime plus 2y equals 5 halves x to the 1 half. And we have this initial condition, y of 1 equals 2. Well, OK, that was fun. Now, is xy prime plus 2y, is that a derivative of something? It is not. Oh. What can we do? Ah, oh, OK. People are like, it looks a lot like that one. And why don't we make it look like that one? And we say, OK, well, how do you do that? Multiply by x. So for c, you can say, look, multiply both sides by x. Now, you probably are like, well, yeah, that's so obvious, right? But this is a, the key idea. Now, why does that make us happy? What happens when we multiply both sides by x? Then we're back to b. And then it's the same work. All right, so what happened here? We can see a couple of, of our key ideas here. We like things which are the derivative of something, so that's... Part A was like, oh, hey, we can see that certain things involving y can look like a derivative. In part B, we said, oh, the left-hand side is a derivative of something. That made it easier for us to solve it. Then the key thing is in part C says, hey, that left-hand side isn't a derivative of something, but we can modify it in a particular way, namely by choosing a good choice for multiplying factor. We can make it look like a derivative of something. So this idea of like, oh, multiply both sides by the right thing. In this case, the right thing was x. Won't always be. It might be something else. 
Then we get to the case where that left-hand side is a nice derivative. Okay, so this idea is what's called an integrating factor, where we're multiplying to help us make integration easier. All right, so a nice wall of text here. This is when it's good to be able to say, oh, print out the notes ahead of time. So, what's going on? So we say an integrating factor for our differential equation we care about, so y prime plus p of x, y equals q of x, it, it's this really well-chosen function. And it's this function rho of x, so that when we multiply everything by rho of x, so notice that because we're multiplying everything by rho of x, it's the same differential equation that we started with. But it's well chosen in the sense that the left-hand side will become a derivative of something. And in fact, we can see what it needs to be the derivative of, of. Because we say, well, look, there's two pieces here. And I see a y prime and a y. And I know I want a derivative of something times y. So by thinking about the product rule, I say, OK, well, whatever is multiplied by y prime, that's the other function I should have. So it should be rho of x times y. That's what this derivative should be. All right. Well, this is great, but we must choose our function rho. And we have to be careful. We must choose wisely. For as a good choice for rho makes it a derivative, a bad choice for rho makes us confused. So how do we make a good choice? Well, we say, well, let's just follow the logic here. We know if we just naively multiply everything by rho what it looks like. So, so this is the multiply everything naively by rho. On the other hand, I know how to take the product rule. So I can take the derivative of rho of x times y. And that would be what I get. And now we do our matching game. We say, oh, <coughs> rho of x, y primes match. Great. So that says the stuff in front of the y has to match, which really says that this rho prime has to match rho times p. That's what we need. If these things match, we've got the right thing, the right stuff, so to speak. So we need to have rho prime has to equal rho of x p of x. OK, great. Do a little division. We need rho prime divided by rho equals p of x. And now we feel like, great, we've introduced another integration problem, another differential equation type problem here that we have to solve. But the good news is this is not too bad. So why? Well, if you ever see the case where there's a function downstairs and the derivative of the function upstairs, this is very easy to integrate. What do you get when you integrate rho prime over rho? Yeah, you get natural log of rho. You can just think about how it works you know, by, by the chain rule. You know, the derivative of natural log of something is 1 over the something, 1 over the inside, times the derivative of the inside. So that's how you end up with rho prime over rho. So we say, great, the natural log of rho of x is the integral of p of x, whatever that is. I don't know why this is a capital x. That should be lowercase x's. All right, so finally you say, look, get rid of the natural log, which means we use our exponential function. So the right function to pick, our integrating factor, is e to the, that's what the x means, the exponential function, e to the integral of p of x. Great, good. Now there's a side note here that says, uh, we can set our constant from integration to zero. Now, what does that mean? Well, normally, when we integrate, for example, we have this log rho of x equals the integral of p of x dx. What would we, we normally add on here? Plus c. We normally add a plus c here. Here is what, what this statement is referring to. This plus c can be plus zero. We can make a choice. And so we want to make our choice here, of this plus c, we, we can choose c equals 0 at this stage. And uh, if, if you're interested, 
Come back, we can talk about this later. All right, so now the method. And the book says, don't memorize the final formula. So this final formula is basically what you see here uh, at step four. That's confusing. Instead, memorize the process, because the process is intuitive. So how does it work? Well, there's a step zero, because the reason it's called step zero is it might not be needed at all. This is if needed. And it says, look, write it in the right form. So the right form says y prime has a one in front, and then plus p of x times y. So in other words, you move the y to the same side. And then everything with only x is moved to the other side. So let's get things in the right form. All right, step, real step one says, hey, we're going to have this integrating factor, this function that multiplies for everything that's just right. It's not too hard, not too soft, just right. And that's the function we just talked about over here. So you integrate whatever is in front of the y. See, so in this case, it's the whatever is in front of the y, that comes into here. Integrate that, e to that. Simplify, and now we say, great. We multiply both sides by rho, and because of all this work over here, the left-hand side is beautiful, the right-hand side is what it is. Hopefully beautiful still, maybe not. But now we integrate both sides and solve for y. And if needed, solve for c. That's if we're looking for a particular solution. All right, so there's the idea. And the rest of the time is just practice so that we can sort of get a feel for how it works. So before we jump into the practice, are there any questions? I don't see any questions, so okay. Let the practice begin. Perhaps the practice might extract some questions from you. So, find the general solution for the differential equation x squared plus 1y prime plus 3xy equals 6x. All right, what do we need to start doing? What's our first step? Notice, someone said divide by x squared plus 1 because we're not in the right form yet. We can't start finding our integrating factor until we get ourselves into the right form. So we have to do that. So we say, okay, we divide by where it's in front of the y prime. So you get y prime is, whoops, not equals plus, yeah, there we go, y prime plus 3x over x squared plus 1. y equals, what's on the other side? 6x. Yeah, 6x over x squared plus 1. All right, good. Now, what comes next? Yeah, so our, our next step is computing, some people said that it compute rho of x, which means find the integrating factor. Some people said, oh, integrate your p of x, and th this is your p of x, what's in front of the y. So the next step, well, let's just integrate that. 3x over x squared plus 1. How do you integrate something like 3x over x squared plus 1? Use substitution, all right. What should we substitute? Okay, u equals x squared plus 1. What does du become? 2x dx. Oh, we were so close. 2x, here's a 3x. Oh. But good news, we have advanced technology. It's called divide by 2. State of the art, just released this last semester, which says a half du is x dx. So we can move constants around. Okay, great. So let's see what this integral becomes with our substitution. What will our constant be? Okay, three halves. Now if you're wondering where the three halves comes from, the three came from the three, then the half came because we're gonna have a half du showing up. All right, what else are we gonna have? Uh, 
So the x squared plus 1 is downstairs, so we should write that as 1 over u. And then the x dx is the du, and then we already have the half showing up. Okay, well how does that integrate? 3 halves natural log of u. And now, remember that normally we have a plus c, but what can we do with this plus c? Yeah, we can make that zero. We get to choose at this stage. So when we're finding our integrating factor, we choose the nice value for c. We could choose c to be anything. We could choose c to be 100. It's just going to give us some annoying uh, paperwork for about two steps, and then it all disappears. We're like, oh, we should have chosen c to be zero. Uh, are we done? OK, so what do we need to do if we're not done? OK, well, replace u by x squared plus 1. All right, so 3 halves, natural log of x squared plus 1. Now, is this our integrating factor, and why not? No, it's not. Why is it not? Yeah, yeah. This is the integral of p of x, but what does our integrating factor look like? Yeah, our integrating factor says you've got to do e to that integral. That, so we've got to raise e to this. Okay, so our integrating factor, rho of x, we don't normally write, write out rho of x equals, but we'll do it now. So it's e to the 3 halves natural log of x squared plus 1. Does that simplify? Okay, how? Okay. Some people are really good at seeing this. I'll do it in slow motion. So the 3 halves is, is multiplying by the log. And there's a nice property about log. It says, hey, if you've got a number in front, it comes up as an exponent. So this is the same as e to the log of x squared plus 1 to the 3 halves power. So this is using properties of logs. And then e to the log of something. Well, they're inverses of each other, so you get x squared plus 1 to the 3 halves. All right. Now, this is the right integrating factor. So we come back to our original equation. I, well, maybe I shouldn't say our original equation, but the one that we started working with to define our integrating factor. And everything gets multiplied by x squared plus 1 to the 3 halves power. All right. So. What does that give us? Well, we have x squared plus 1 to the 3 halves power times y prime plus what's the next term going to become? 3x. Anything else? x squared plus 1 to the 1 half. Once we simplify, because there's an x squared plus 1 downstairs, there's 3 halves of them upstairs, so there's a total of 1 half. And don't forget the y equals on the other side. Six x times x squared plus 1 to the 1 half. All right, now let's suppose we've done our job. If we've done our job well, what should be true about the left-hand side? It's the derivative of something. Do you see what it's going to be the derivative of? It's the integrating factor times y. Now, if you were paranoid, maybe, for example, you were on a test and wanted to get lots of points, what could you do at this stage to say, how can I check to make sure I did it right? You could actually take this derivative. So you'd have the first function times y prime. And then you say, OK, what's the derivative of this? And if you're careful, the 3 halves comes down. You have x squared plus 1 to the 1 half. And what else will you have? You'll have a 2x by the chain rule. And 3 halves times 2x gives you 3x. So if you're not certain, just take the derivative of this expression, and you should get that expression. And if you don't, what does that mean? Mistakes were made. 
Maybe it was made when you were checking your answer. I hate it when that happens. Or maybe somewhere else. Okay, but this is where we're up to. What's our next step? Yeah, we're going to integrate both sides. So we're going to integrate both sides with respect to x. But of course, the left-hand side is a free integral. What is the integral of the left-hand side? S squared plus 1 to the 3 halves times y. How do we integrate the right-hand side? Wow, use the u substitution again. Okay, so what's the substitution that we should make? u equals x squared plus 1. Now, in this case, if you're paranoid, some people are like, we've already used u in this problem. You can go to the next letter of the alphabet. Or you can say, oh, it actually is the exact same substitution. So maybe it's not so bad that if we reuse it here. All right, du, 2x dx. Well, do we need to divide by 2 this time? I mean, we could. But notice, what do you have? 6, which is shorthand for 3 times 2. So you really do have a 2x there. All right. So what does this integral become? There's a 3, we'll be left over. The 2x dx becomes du. And what does this x squared plus 1 to the 1 half become? u to the 1 half. All right, what's that integral? So it'll be u to the what power? 3 halves. And then there's multiplying front by the reciprocal. So by 2 thirds. The threes cancel, so we get 2u to the 3 halves. And here's a case where we do need our plus c. And uh, because we, this constant does matter, so we have to keep track of this one. Here? Well, let's see where that came from. So we multiplied 6x over x squared plus 1 times x squared plus 1 to the 3 halves. And because this is like x squared plus 1 to the 1 power here. So you, when you combine, you need to do 3 halves minus 1, which should give you 1 half. So I think we're OK. Good, good to check, though. You should, you, should, you should check. I make mistakes. Uh, hopefully, not as many. My, I don't have as much time left to do. Now, you're still young. I've, I've only got like a few more decades of mistakes to make. But you've got like five or six decades worth of mistakes. So you've got plenty of time. Okay, so are we done? Are we, what, what, what should we do to finish then? Okay, well first, yeah, we should put the x squared plus 1 back in. So this equals 2, x squared plus 1 to the 3 halves, and plus c. All right. Just, now, is that our final answer? No, but we're really close. What, what do we need to do to like put us over the top? What, what can we do? Divide by itself, and to do that, we divide by what's in front of it. So y equals 2 plus c. Is there anything else? Oh, yeah. Everything gets divided by x squared plus 1 to the 3 halves. So make sure and carry that all the way through. And now we really are done. That's it. That's it. Ah, oh, nice, nice. So this gives you the flavor of what happens, right? We say, okay, make sure it's in the right form, figure out the ingrained factor, multiply both sides by the ingrained factor, and then, okay, left side easy, right side, okay, do a little bit of work, clean it up. Life is good. So it's not too bad, not too bad. Uh, I should have asked any questions before we move to the next one. Hi, I have a question. Yes, hi. Sure. So, uh, when we were solving for rho, right. we could just make that c zero. Yes, we can pick our c. Okay. Okay. And yes. So it, but in this case, since we did the full, the full monkey, we didn't need to Well, be, but really, there's two integrals that happen here. No, no. Yeah, that's what I mean. The second and integral we need. We need the second integral you need to keep. The first one you don't. Now you might say, why, Steve? Why do you get to get rid of that first c? And, okay, let's suppose we didn't. Let's, let's, what would happen here? So 
if we kept the C, so I'll, I'll put a, a little, I'll follow it through just to show you what happens. What would happen when we take E to this? We'd have that plus C. What would, what would we end up doing here? It'd become a, a constant multiplying downstairs. So if you have a plus C here, the effect for rho is you've multiplied by a C. Now remember, what do you do next? You're multiplying everything by rho. So everything would get a factor of C. Well, what can you do since everything has a factor of C? You can divide out by that factor of C. And so that's, that's why it doesn't matter. So since it doesn't matter, let's be kind to ourselves. We love ourselves. Zero. Zero's our friend. Zero's our friend. All right. Next problem. Find the solution for y prime equals 3 plus y tangent of x, where y of 0 equals 2. All right. This problem looks nice. So let's do it twice. How can we solve this problem? This is, some, this is a problem that we can actually solve using separable differential equation techniques. So let's solve it using separable differential equation techniques. And let's solve it using this integrating factor. And let's compare. Now you might say, wait, wait, we can use different techniques for the same problem? And the answer is yes. Now, you might say, well, which one should I use? And the answer is the easier one. And of course, you might say, which one's that? Uh, I think you'll get a feel for it. There's context here. It depends. So if we were doing it by, by separable, and I think separable problems go pretty quickly, notwithstanding the fact that I spent an hour and 45 minutes talking about 12 problems. Uh, they go pretty quickly, right? So you see I have dy over dx is equal to 3 plus y tangent of x. So I'm going to, for the sake of time, I'll go through this a little bit faster. So the idea is, well, gather things. So we could say dy over 3 plus y, so I'm putting all the y parts together, equals tangent of x dx. And now the separation is done, go straight into integration. What's the integral of dy over 3 plus y? Natural log of 3 plus y. And that actually works. What's the integral of tangent of x? We'll see who read their announcements. Log secant. Yes, yeah, somebody did say log secant. There were some people who said secant squared. That's the derivative of tangent x. That's OK. You're, you're making the connections, which is good. You just have to you know, clean up the connections. Uh, anything else? Plus C. OK, are we done? Well, not if we want to find our solution. What do we need to do? Raise everything to E power. So we get 3 plus Y equals what? Secant of X times C. Times C. What? How did the plus become time? Well, that's because it's e to the, right? So e to the log secant x plus c is the same as e to the log secant x times e to the c, right? So that's how that addition upstairs becomes multiplication downstairs. So, all right. So our general solution says y is equal to negative 3 plus some appropriate choice of a constant times secant x. Now, are we done here? We gotta solve for C. Yeah, we've got to solve for C. There's an initial condition given to us. OK, so we're told when x equals 0, that y equals 2. That's our initial condition. So 2 is negative 3 plus C times secant of 0. And secant of 0 is 1. Oh, wow, good, good. The other class needed a hint. And I said, it rhymes with one. And after the hint, they got it. All right. So, all right. Uh, so, what is C? 
C is 5. So our final answer would be y equals negative 3 plus 5 secant x. Okay, great. Good. That's not so bad. All right, so that's if we did it using separable. Okay, well, but I said, this problem's so nice, we're going to do it twice. So, what's next? Okay, so we'll do it using this method of integrating factors. So what's the first step if we're going to do our integrating factors? I'll abbreviate it as IF. Now, so we have Y prime, and then we need to get the Y term. So what's the Y term going to look like? So, you can distribute that tangent of x through. So you have a y tangent of x, so that will come across. So minus tangent of x, y, equals 3 tangent of x. All right, so this is of our right form. So make sure you pay attention. Our function p of x includes the minus sign. So... What is the integral of minus tangent of x? It's log cosine. What? What are you doing to us, Steve? You're ruining my belief in you. OK. Uh, what, what, what is it really? Come on. It's minus log secant, right? But what can you do with this minus sign? Think of it as a minus 1, and it comes in as an exponent. So it's like secant of x to the minus 1 power, or 1 over secant, which is cosine. So that's what's happening. OK. All right. Great. So. Uh, and then, of course, there's there are plus c, but we can choose that to be equal to zero. All right, so our integrating factor, rho of x, is e to the log of cosine of x. So what do we need to multiply by? What does that simplify to? Yeah, cosine x. Okay, so we're, we're going to multiply everything by cosine x. So we now have cosine of x y prime, tangent of x times cosine x, what does that become? Sine x equals still sine x. The left-hand side, what is that? Right, and it's the derivative of something. Do you, do you remember what it should be? Yeah, the derivative of cosine x, your, your integrating factor times y. Okay, so now we integrate both sides. What's the left-hand side become? The integral of the derivative of cosine x times y becomes <coughs> cosine x times y. Okay, integral of 3 sine x becomes yeah, the integral of sine, this is one you have to always think about. Is it positive sine? Is it is it I'm sorry, positive cosine, negative cosine? Uh, so the integral of sine is negative cosine. Anything else we need to throw in there? Plus c. OK, now what can we do? Solve for y. Divide everything by cosine. We get y equals negative 3, because the cosines will cancel. c over cosine x is another way to say what? c secant x. And notice exactly what we had before. Everything else a after this point becomes the same, so I'm not going to repeat it. So we see, yeah, we get the same answer. Should that shock us? Yeah, we would be shocked if we got different answers. We're like, what? You should only have one answer. There should only be the one true answer when you do a problem. All right, well, let's, uh, let's set up a problem. 
to finish ourselves up. A nice relaxing problem. So, a 120 gallon tank initially contains 90 pounds of salt dissolved uh, in 90 gallons of water. Oh, there's a typo here. Dissolved. Okay. Brine. Now, in case you're wondering what is brine, salt water. Contain two pounds of gallon per gallon of salt flows into the tank at a rate of four gallons per minute. So maybe we should start drawing a picture here. So here's our picture. This is our tank. And it has a 120 capacity. And then we have things are flowing in. And in particular, the, the rate of flow in is four gallons per minute. All right. And uh, we can actually say more, right? The salt water has two pounds per gallon. And uh, so if this is four gallons per minute of the brine. How much salt is flowing in in any given minute? So we have two, four gallons per minute of the brine, two pounds per gallon of salt means how much salt comes in? Eight pounds per minute of salt. That's a lot of salt. Okay, so our, our tank here we, has uh, some capacity. All right, where are we at? The well-stirred mixture flows out. Okay, so there's something out, out of the bottom and it's flowing out at three gallons per minute. Okay, now there's the question. How much salt does the tank contain when it is full? All right, so there's a lot for us to digest here and a couple minutes for us to do it. So we're gonna digest quickly. First off, let's talk about the inflow versus the outflow. Uh, four gallons come in, three gallons go out. What does that tell us about what's happening to the amount of, of fluid in the tank? It's, it's going up, going up by one gallon per minute. So initially, at time t equals zero, there's 90 gallons. Then in general, we can say, uh, after t minutes, how much will there be? That'll be 90 plus t. That's how much there is t minutes afterwards. Now, how long will it take for us to fill the tank? 30 minutes. So the real question is, now, how much salt at time t equals 30? Okay, so we're after the salt. So we don't have a variable name. So let's give ourselves a variable name. Salt starts with S. So how about S for salt? Salt in the tank. Now, we know some information. How much salt is there at time zero? Ninety. Right? Initially, there's 90. So initially, that's an initial condition. So there's 90 pounds. Now the other thing is, what's the change? So there's a differential equation going on. So if I want to know about the salt, I can say, well, how is the salt changing? Well, two things happen to the salt. So there's some salt that comes in, and that's going to make more salt, so that's a plus. And then there's some salt that goes out. And that'll be a minus. So if we can figure out, well, what can we say about the rate at which salt comes in? And what can we say about the rate that salt goes out? Then we can say, hey, we know how salt is changing. Well, what can we say about the rate at which salt is coming in? Yeah, eight pounds per minute, we see it. Eight. What can we say about the rate of salt going out? OK. It's not constant, it varies. So we have to keep, keep in mind. So there's, there's this, first off, three gallons per minute. So there's a three. Then someone said the concentration. How do you figure out the concentration? So, so this last piece here is the concentration. So the concentration would be found by taking the total amount of salt. What is the total amount of salt? S. S over how much liquid there is, the amount of fluid. How much fluid is there? 90 plus T. And now, that's the setup. We've accounted for all the salt, right? We know how much there is initially. We've talked about salt coming in, we've talked about salt going out. There's no other way salt can come in or out. So this is a nice differential equation, which 
if we had time, we would solve it. But we don't have time. So, well, the mysteries of life. <laughs>